It's an honor to have you all here. We want to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Tony Thurman, and I have the pleasure of representing the 15th Assembly District uh, in our in the, the legislature in California. Uh, I'm sure many of you do know. Uh, if you don't know, uh, it includes a number of cities, including parts of Oakland, where we stand tonight, uh, Piedmont, Berkeley, Albany, Emeryville, uh, Richmond, El Cerrito, Canole, Berkeley, San Pablo, Kensington, and El Sobrante. If I missed anybody, please holler out because <laughs> I work for you and we don't want to miss anybody. So um, one thing that we know, that's a very diverse district that runs along the I-80 corridor. As you all know, living along the I-80 corridor is a very expensive proposition at this time. We are seeing dramatic, dramatic increase in rent costs. We're seeing a phenomenon where people are buying homes in cash, upwards of $800,000 for the cost in communities like Oakland and Berkeley. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who purchased a home in cash for $800,000. What I do know is that people who we care about are being pushed out of these communities as we speak. I spent 20 years working as a social worker, and probably the number one issue that I've seen our families experience next to not having a quality education is housing instability. And so we know that when families are spending more than 50% of their income just for rent, what does that lead? And the same is true for seniors. I did a bill this year to help increase SSI and SSP for our seniors, because what we found is seniors making $800 a month in their benefits after they pay their rent, they don't have money for medicine or food and they're eating in the shelters and we've got to make change. So tonight, what we're doing is working to figure out ways and solutions to address the crisis of housing and the lack of affordable housing. I want to say right up front that this past year in the assembly, I had the honor of supporting two very important bills that have been in the conversation um, to focus on uh, providing housing support, low-income housing support, and that's um, Speaker Atkins' Bill AB 1335, which I supported, will continue to support, and uh, Assemblymember David Chu's Bill AB 35, which would have um, provided $100 million for a low-income housing tax credit. That bill was vetoed, uh, but we know that that bill will be brought back this year, and I'll be co-authoring that bill, and I will be co-authoring the Speaker's Bill and working with the Speaker to get those bills out. I I'm committed to low-income housing, support every day of the week. Uh, but I'm also concerned about others in our community who cannot afford to live in our community who do not qualify for some of the low-income housing programs. By that, I mean working people. By that, I mean people in the room. By that, I mean a teacher or a firefighter or a nurse or a police officer or anyone who makes any amount of money where you don't qualify for some of the federal programs and state programs that are there to help our neediest residents. See, the example I often use is in right now in the school district that's West Contra Costa, or we call it Richmond, a starting salary for a teacher is $42,000 a year. You do the math. If you're making $42,000 a year and the houses are selling upwards of $800,000 a year, you cannot buy one, and the rents have skyrocketed. Uh, we think that we can do something about what I've been calling Workforce housing, it just means working people who cannot afford to live in the communities where they work. We know that the state of California has fallen so far behind in providing new units of housing to keep up with our population across all income levels. We know that just to keep pace with where our population growth is, the state of California needs to increase by 150,000 units of housing. 150,000 units of housing. We've lost pace, whether it's rental or home ownership, and we know that it has devastating effects to our communities. People are being pushed further and further out. They're not able to invest in their own communities. People work hard in their communities and they cannot live in their communities. We would like to create a pathway for them to be able to do so. Uh, for one, I think that we can pass a low-income housing tax credit. I also think that we can pass a workforce housing tax credit to aid both, and I intend to, to work on those things. Tonight, you'll hear some of these ideas, and we're gonna give you an opportunity to give us feedback 
on many of the strategies that we've discussed for improving housing. Because we know that you cannot change things without having some money. We know that our cities took a devastating blow in losing redevelopment agency funds, and our cities haven't recovered. And so, while I think it's important for developers to give more money, and I think it's important for big companies to give more money, and I'm prepared to support any you know, tax measure that's local or regional, I also think that the state has a responsibility to support our cities and to support our citizens. And that's why what we talk about here, the ideas that we discuss here, will be folded up into a bill that we intend to move forward in the legislature. I want to acknowledge one of our partners who are here tonight uh, from local government who've been just really letting us know how great the need is, and, and we hear you. And, and I want to start with one of, uh, one of the people who's been outspoken, and it represents the part of Oakland that we represent, North Oakland. That's Oakland City Councilmember Dan Cow is here. Ladies and gentlemen, Councilmember Dan Cow. Also want to acknowledge one of our partners from the city of Berkeley, two uh, Berkeley council members I've seen here tonight who've been working very hard on the issue of affordable housing. Uh, Berkeley city council member Chris Worthington is here. Council member Berkeley. Council member, Berkeley council member Lori Drost. from Oakland, uh, we have uh, a champion, you know, we, we, we make the connection between affordable housing and education. Um, we think, we talked to our districts last week, we did a town hall, we've been doing one of these a week. Um, <coughs> I promise you to my staff, it's the last one. Uh, but the one that we did on education, what came out from our education partners is, they can't address the achievement gap because they're losing teachers. So I mentioned the starting salary, some of our districts have told us their biggest issue as it relates to educational goals is their inability to retain teachers. So we're making the nexus between housing and education. And one of our great leaders who gets that is one of the school board members from Oakland Unified, and that's Jamoke Hinton Hock, she was here. We have a lot of partners who are here. Uh, we have some electives in transportation. We think there's a nexus there as well. I want to call out AC Transit Board of Directors member Mark Williams is here. And I saw one of our board of directors, Rebecca Salsman, who is here. Transportation. She got a shout out and a point out. Uh, we have a number of council members who are represented by staff here today. Um, I'm sorry, we missed another elected official from uh, West County the Steve Sanitary District Board member, who's been a great partner in talking with us on these issues, uh, Al Miller from the Steve Sanitary District Board. We have a representative here for Supervisor Keith Carson is here. Uh, Aisha Brown is here. Is there someone else here? We have a representative for Council Member Abel Guillen is here tonight. Um, we have a representative here for Council Member Guillen. Was here earlier? Oh, she is here. Thank you. As well as the Berkeley Council Member Lori Capitelli is here in the time. A representative from the City of Richmond from the Office of Mayor Butt is here. And from the, I'm sorry, Mr. Commissioner from the Rent Stabilization Board in Berkeley, someone who's working on this issue often, and that's Judy Hunt. Judy J. Hunt. We have a representative from Council Member. Uh, Lynette McElhaney's office here in Oakland is here. Thank you. And we have a, a judge who gets it. He gets the nexus between criminal justice and justice reform and helping young people. Uh, that's our judge, uh, Gordon Branco. Thank you. Uh, we've got a great panel for you here tonight. We've got some folks who are doing this work every single day. They're experts in the field. They're going to share with you some of their ideas about solutions. We're going to have a chance to react to some of those solutions. We're going to talk a little bit about money because the governor has been very clear. If we don't come up with a solution and a way to either get to a two-thirds vote or a revenue source to get it done, he does not believe that we can fund any housing activity from the general fund without a stable funding source. So we're going to talk about money and we're going to talk about how to get that done. I want to introduce you to our panel. Uh, many of them who you know because they've been out doing the work. 
and they're going to help set the context for us. We're going to start with two panelists who represent their cities tonight, and they're going to help us to set the context for what we are doing. Um, as we uh, prepare to do that, though, I do want to give a shout out to my colleague uh, who represents the rest of Oakland, uh, including where we stand. Uh, he's represented tonight by Diego Gonzalez on his staff, and that's Assembly Member Rob Bonta. We, we have great support in the Bay Area Caucus. Mr. Bonta and I have spoken about how we're going to work together to move these bill ideas. We work with our colleagues in San Francisco. We started this process as a listening tour. We've had several meetings. We've brought together stakeholders from every sector that we think has a role to play in improving the solutions or uh, creating solutions. We've invited realtors. We've invited developers. We've invited nonprofit housing developers, our city partners, tax experts. We brought everybody together and we've had several meetings and we'll continue to do so until we can land on solutions that will help to move this forward. This is a tough, tough issue with no easy solution. It didn't happen overnight. No one solution will fix this. So you'll hear things tonight that you may like and you may hear some things tonight that you don't like and that's fine. We don't expect you to agree with everything that you hear. We just ask that you hear it and be respectful about it. You don't have to boo, but if you want to boo, boo quietly. <laughs> we do everything loudly, right? But if you don't like it and you want to object, you can object. But if you think something really does work, then, then make that known. And again, we're giving you an opportunity tonight to respond directly to every single funding strategy that you hear tonight. They're going to be handing out surveys that allow you to do that, and you can make your voice heard. We did an online uh, survey. We heard from 200 people directly who've given us solutions. We've sent thousands of emails. And we're going to be asking our members throughout the state of California and the legislature to make this a top priority for this year. Uh, on to our first panel to really set the stage from the perspective of our cities, what we feel in our cities. I'm honored that tonight we have from the city of Oakland, uh, Michelle Berg, who is the director of the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, Ms. Berg has been the director since 2012. And through her leadership, she has been able to enact programs to address the foreclosure and housing crisis and to support set-aside programs to help replace the loss of redevelopment funds. Uh, Ms. Michelle Berg, we want to welcome you. Immediately to her left, the city manager from the city of Richmond, Mr. Bill Lindsay, uh, who has been the city manager and has helped the city to steer out of concerns about violence, has helped the city to stabilize its school system, has been a great partner in the conversation, and uh, is very knowledgeable about the needs of Richmond. Please welcome the city manager, Mr. Bill Lindsay. So we're going to take a few minutes to start with these two panels. We're going to talk about um, setting the context from their cities, and then we're going to hear uh, from our very distinguished panelists who are going to have some solutions for us. We'll hear from them in just a few minutes. So, Ms. Berg, if you would, we're going to take three or four minutes to go through your thoughts on the city's challenges and what the city needs. Oh, three or four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening. I want to thank Tony Durbin for having this forum. Uh, we're at a critical time. I'll just give you some, I guess, highlights of what's going on in Oakland. Um, we are at a, a, a changing time in Oakland where we're seeing um, the rising rents and a lot of individuals who have been historically living in Oakland that are leaving Oakland. And we want to keep the diversity in Oakland. So through the efforts of the mayor and, and many of our council members, we are trying to come up with strategies around um, battling this issue. I just want to give you a, a little concept of what's going on, we have a project Bridge is doing at the MacArthur Park Station. There's 94 units of affordable housing that will be there, and we receive 1,500 applications for 94 units. And so that just gives you a, a, a taste of where the need is, that for 94 units, there were 1,500 applications that were received, and at that point, they had to start turning them away because there were still more than one to apply. I think as um, Mr. Thurman said, we there is a critical need, and when we talk about affordable housing, it is no longer just for low-income in, in individuals. Affordable housing means being able to afford the housing based upon your income. So if you're making $100,000 and you're paying $50,000 for your housing, that's not affordable. 
So we really need to look at a concept of how we define affordable housing because we want to make sure that we are serving all the populations that needs our workforce. That means the teachers, <coughs> the police officers, nurses, firefighters, because they are the heart and soul of the city. So in the city of Oakland, we are looking at many different initiatives to combat that problem. We were successful in opening the Housing Assistance Center where we have individuals that come in with a variety of problems. And right now we're seeing the problem of Section 8 vouchers. Section 8 vouchers used to be a golden ticket. If you had a Section 8 voucher, you could basically go and live anywhere because you felt like that was guaranteed rent. Now that is no longer the issue. Landlords do not want to accept Section 8 vouchers because now they feel that they can get market rate rent higher than Section 8. And unfortunately, HUD is looking at lowering the fair market rent for Section 8 vouchers. So at a time when we are seeing rent skyrocket, and we are seeing that there is an increasing need, HUD government wants to lower the fair market rent. We also lost our redevelopment money. Here in the city of Oakland, that was $27 million that went towards low and moderate income housing. $27 million. It's not a lot, but it, it makes a difference, and we were able to do at least three to 400 units of housing with that money. Now, we really don't get, receive anything from the state, but fortunately, because of city council and um, then Mayor Kwan, we were success successful in passing a set aside of 25% that will go towards affordable housing. Now, that's not $27 million, it's $4 million, but with those funds, we are leveraging additional funds to meet the needs, so I think just to put in the concept, um, the regional um, housing needs allocation said that City of Oakland needs to do about 14,000 units of housing to meet the need. We believe that that number was triple that, so we need the range between 14,000 and 45,000 just to meet the need. So, is there a need? Yes, and um, we are doing everything that we can in Oakland to combat that need. Thank you, Ms. Berger. Thank you, uh, Slope Member Thurman, and, and um, it really is, it's rather intimidating to be on this, this panel it, it, and uh, among housing experts and, and um, in terms of the needs, uh, I think Ms. Bird articulated it very well. I'm, I'm going to be the one who, when we get to the finding solutions part, is going to open my notebook and take a lot of notes because uh, I'm very much in a learning no mode. The, um, we're no different than, than other cities in the Bay Area. The, the, the need is, is, uh, for housing is acute. You know, I'll start off, though, by uh, telling you some good news. You know, the good news is that several years ago, Richmond had an unemployment rate that exceeded 18%. And now our unemployment rate is down to about 5.5%. It's uh, below or right at where the state average is. It's, it's uh, um, right at where the rest of Contra Costa County is. It's the lowest that it's been, except for perhaps one time since World War II. That's the lowest uh, unemployment rate for the city of Richmond. That is terrific news. We've had some good employers uh, coming in, and uh, they offer consistent work, but uh, it's comparatively low pay and, and sometimes limited opportunity for advancement. So with that great news on the employment front, the bad news, of course, is that we have people that are working in our community that can't find housing. Um, just a, a couple of uh, statistics. Um, Ms. Bird talked about Section 8. We have uh, several thousand Section 8 vouchers um, in, the, in the city. We now have a waiting list of Section 8 vouchers of about 2,800. And that's on top of about uh, a little less than 2,000 vouchers that we have citywide. Um, with the state of the market, with the, with the way it is, uh, we you can conceivably see people on that Section 8 waiting list literally forever and not ever find housing, uh, which, is, uh, which is a shame. Because that used to be something, as Ms. Bird indicated, that could be an effective program. It's no longer something that's effective given the tight housing market. Um, we also have uh, collected statistics about what people are paying in terms of, of um, housing costs. Uh, our estimates show that over 60% of owner-occupied units, that's owner-occupied units, are overpaying for housing, uh, defined as, as uh, paying more than 30% of their household income on housing. In the rental market, 
our statistics say that 82% of renters are overpaying. 82%. 60% overpaying if they own the home, 80% over 80% if they're rentals. And, and these are really very alarming numbers. Our regional housing needs allocation for uh, the period from 2014 to 2022 is obviously much less than Oakland's. It's about 2,500. And, um, and uh, like Ms. Berg, we think that that that's number is, is quite small, um, given what we're seeing in the market and how difficult it is to produce housing. We have um, about 800, um, 800 uh, units in the queue right now. Uh, we want to try to build on that momentum. We're actually doing well at, uh, at all levels of affordability. In fact, the, the above monitor is, is the, the struggle for us to provide that, uh, um, that market. I'll say a couple of, of things. I, I do agree this is a very critical time. Uh, fortunately, we have a city council that, from a policy point of view, really wants to produce housing. They really want to increase the supply of housing, and they're very acute, they're acutely aware of affordability. Um, and um, I know that we have uh, housing advocates in this room. We have them in Richmond. Uh, one thing that I would really encourage is that not only do they look at this from a broad policy perspective, but they also look at these uh, at individual projects and come and support individual pro uh, projects that increase the supply of housing. It has to translate. This advocacy needs to go to the micro level as well. Um, I'd love to see redevelopment come back in some form. Uh, one just quick suggestion, it would be nice if the state could at least unconditionally release all of the former redevelopment agency properties back to the city if they are used for housing purposes. Um, that's, not a, that's not a dollar transfer, um, it's maybe a foregone dollars in the future, but that would immediately uh, uh, provide a uh, break a log jam and as, uh, allow us to start working to, uh, to develop some more housing in, in Richmond. So, uh, Senator, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nancy. <laughs> we're going to shortly be moving into your questions and answers. We're going to invite Ms. Bird and Mr. Lindsay to be a part of that conversation, but we want to move to the, the next part of our panel, uh, which gives us an opportunity to uh, hear some solutions that could work, to hear things that are working in other places, to hear things that are being envisioned. Um, as we prepare to do that, I just want to acknowledge we have two other rent board members here from uh, the Berkeley Rent Board. Uh, James Chang from the Rent Board is here tonight. Mr. Chang, thank you for being here. We also have Paola Laverde Levine from the Berkeley Rent Board. Thank you. I want to introduce our panelists uh, immediately to my left. Uh, Junius Williams, who many of you know is, for his great work as a Chief Executive Officer at Urban Strategies Council. Um, he is known for his work on community building support and advocacy in Oakland. He's done extensive work with our schools on desegregation, on education equity, and he has worked on numerous community building and community development efforts in Oakland and the Bay Area. Please welcome Mr. Junius Williams. <laughs> Ms. Carol Vellante, immediately to his left, someone who also needs no no introduction. Uh, many of us know her and appreciate her for being the Assistant Secretary for Housing, Federal and Housing Commissioner at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development at a very tough time in our nation's history. We think things are tough now in Congress. She was there at a time when um, it was very difficult to get anything done, found a way to get things done. She is now the Donald Turner Distinguished Professor in Affordable Housing and Urban Policy uh, at the Turner Center uh, for housing innovation at the University of California, Berkeley, and we're deeply honored to have Ms. Carol Galante here. <laughs> and all the way to the left, Mr. Michael Lane, who is the policy director at the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. He personally promised me that we're going to get the governor to sign a, a gazillion dollars worth of tax credits to address low income housing and workforce housing. Um, I'm not going to say the exact number, but you know. When you start talking about a workforce housing tax credit, a lot of people get nervous and they say, well, you're not going to get any federal match to that. They start talking about how expensive it is. But, you know, Mr. Laney has an understanding that there is a nexus between what we do for our, for our neediest residents who are low income, as well as for working people who are also many are low income, but just don't qualify for the program. So we appreciate your perspective and the work that's being done at the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. Welcome, Mr. McElroy. Again, 
we'll give each panel uh, three or four minutes to talk about some solutions. We'll move through that and then start talking about money, and then we'll take your questions from the audience. And so, Mr. Williams, if you would, start us off. Thank you. I am probably an outlier up here because I'm not a housing expert. Um, I, uh, as the uh, assembly member mentioned, uh, I'm an advocate uh, by training and disposition. And let me just say a couple things around framing before I talk about kind of how we're approaching it. I am extremely frustrated by this conversation. Right. I'm frustrated because uh, we're displaying all of the typical uh, symptoms of adolescence. What kind of country doesn't take care of its people? Mm -hmm. That we're in the 21st century having an argument about housing our people is absolutely ridiculous. Like the conversation we had about feeding our people, about health care, we need to mature as a nation and make a basic commitment that we're going to take care of the basic needs of our people. We're having a, a conversation that should have been, uh, we should have been out of a couple of centuries ago and we're still doing it. Uh, let, let me also say this about, uh, boy, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. About the other politicians, I refuse to accept that we don't have enough money to do right by the people in terms of funding housing. The issue of taxing ourselves, everything needs to be uh, on the table around uh, ridding ourselves of, of the housing crisis uh, that we're in, because all of you know that the instability of folks in housing leads to a whole series of other problems that make our neighborhoods and communities unstable and that we need to uh, address that in the long term. Let me just say a, a couple of things. I like uh, the assembly member's idea about uh, workforce housing, but I'm a little concerned about the definition of workforce. Uh, while I appreciate as much as anybody coming from a family of educators uh, taking care of teachers, I have gone on record repeatedly saying that they are grossly uh, underpaid and as a community in Oakland especially we need to do something. I respect what law enforcement attempts to do but when I talk about workforce housing it's not for people who are in uh, who are in a unique set of circumstances. When you talk about the typical definition of workforce housing we're talking about public service uh, teachers, uh, police officers, public safety folks, nurses, they are a unique population in the sense that they are highly educated, they're unionized, uh, they are going to get incremental pay increases, and I'm not justifying that they're enough, but they're there, as opposed to the people who are in that room from 30 to 60 percent of area media income who are also working, sometimes two and three jobs, and not able to make ends meet. So I would just argue that as we think about workforce housing, we think about the entirety of the workforce, and there are people down in that 30 to 60 percent range that we need to think about how the housing is going to occur for them. Very quickly, I, I'm an advocate and represent also the Oakland Community Land Trust. I would just make a quick point, no matter where the resources come from for affordable housing, for workforce housing, we need to make sure that the subsidies that go into the housing are permanently uh, there. Uh, we have a pattern of investing in affordable housing and let some people walk away with those investments. Right. The reason that we subscribe to a land trust model is the public investment in subsidy in housing is there permanently, generation after generation. So I would simply argue that I'm for any form of taxes, including taxing myself. I think we are all spoiled in America around how much uh, we uh, tax ourselves to take care of the common good. But I think we also need to be mindful that if we make those investments, that they are permanent investments and no particular family or individual is able to walk away uh, with our investment because it needs to be intergenerational.
pick up on one thing that you said, and you're correct, just so that no one leaves here thinking that when we say workforce housing, we mean only people who are in public sector jobs, like a teacher or a nurse. We're saying any working person, a person who earns a working person's wage, should be able to rent or own in the community where they live. So our bill, when we say we want to do a workforce housing tax credit, we are not saying it's a set aside just for public employees. We're saying it's for all working people. And that sadly, someone who makes $30,000 a year, $40,000 a year, does not qualify for the programs as many of them are currently stated for the reasons that Ms. Bird stated, that there are no redevelopment funds, there are no moderate housing funds. So I appreciate you giving us a push so that we can clarify. We're talking about all working people being able to afford where they live. Thank you. Ms. Glenn. Well, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, so <laughs> I was a buffer because the mic was high. <laughs> right. uh, let, let me start by saying I, I, I coined a acronym. So if you think of the first letter of each of the words I'm going to say, it comes out to BRIM. So hopefully our cup will run it over uh, with BRIM here. Uh, and I came up with this because you know, being able to articulate in two or three minutes the ideas that we all need to, I think, embrace to ensure that families have homes uh, that they can afford to live in um, is, is really hard work and complicated, actually, at the legislative uh, level and at the administrative level. So BRIM stands for Build, Reduce Costs, Intensify, and Money. So we are not going to get anywhere on this issue unless we build, build, build. But we have to bring down the overall cost and escalation of rents and home prices by ensuring that we are building on an adequate basis uh, to you know, start to bring down the overall cost of housing for, for all people. So how could the state uh, help, and I'm focusing on state um, legislative solutions here, uh, use of underutilized and vacant land. I think the state has taken some steps on this. There's a lot more that can be done. For 30 years, I've been passing the DMV site in San Francisco, which is two full blocks of parking in the city of San Francisco. And the one in Oakland, you know, could be decked over and put some housing on the top as well. So underutilized, not just vacant, but underutilized use of public lands, including state agency uh, properties, I think is a, a solution. Strengthening the teeth of housing element law or CEQA to say you can't just pretend you're zoning for it, you've got to actually build it. Uh, so you come up with these numbers through regional allocation needs and there isn't really teeth at the end of the day to being sure that communities are doing their fair share uh, in housing element law. This is not popular uh, with some of the local elected officials probably in the room, but <coughs> I do think at some point having the state say, if you're not taking, you're not doing enough building, you're not taking your fair share at some point, uh, and other states do this to some degree, then you're gonna lose your local authority to approve uh, developments uh, in your community. So build, build, build. Uh, reduce costs. There are a number of ways that uh, we can reduce costs, some of which I think are private sector solutions, uh, multifamily, uh, off-site construction is you know, becoming something that uh, is gaining traction, uh, which can help in terms of reducing costs. But there are things that the state, again, can help do with respect to um, uh, uh, various kinds of uh, regulations around uh, that, around off-site construction, that would be very helpful. I'm not gonna talk about intensifying uh, much, but really, it, in my mind, that is we have probably 70%, 65%, depending on the community, of our housing stock is single-family detached homes. And there are lots of ways that we can intensify the use of those neighborhoods uh, with accessory dwelling units and other kinds of activities, uh, particularly um, close to, to transit. So the last is money, and I'm gonna leave most of this to, to Michael, but I, I would say the idea of a workforce 
uh, housing tax credit in addition to the low income housing tax credit. I don't know the parameters, uh, assembly member, that you're thinking of for that, but thinking about using uh, a tax credit for down payment assistance for first time home buyers, for that um, people up the income scale who are spending so much money on rent that they can't accumulate the down payment that they need uh, to purchase a home, even if they could afford the home uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So I think that is uh, something that we should consider. And last, I would say the state already has a individual renter's tax credit. It's not very big. Uh, and I think expanding the renter's tax credit is something that uh, could be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. questions about things you're hearing that uh, the staff from our office is available to hand you a card to jot down your questions so just raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Um, Mr. Wayne. Great well this is a, a really important conversation and I'm uh, really glad to be a part of it and we really are in a perfect storm in terms of, of the housing affordability crisis and really flat wages and uneven recovery some have done really well but for the vast majority, and even the new jobs that we're creating, two-thirds of those are at $50,000 and below in terms of what they're paying. And so we really have a bifurcated housing market and a, and a broken housing market. And on top of that, over just over the past seven years, we've lost nearly 90% of all the funding that we had at the federal and state levels. Uh, and you know, obviously part of that is a sequester, and even with some of the relief that we're getting, it's not sufficient, the HUD budget's been gutted. And at the state level, of course, Governor Brown eliminated redevelopment. And then my organization came back and co-sponsored significant pieces of legislation, both on the policy and funding side of the past five years. And he's vetoed every one of those bills. And so you know, I don't think he was able to make it tonight. But, you know, but we're going to keep coming back. And it's great to be able to work with some members like us and with Thurman. We're not going to give up on the capital. Uh, we think, but we do think one of the bills he vetoed was inclusionary housing. You've got to have inclusionary housing to be able to infill and to direct development in these prior development areas where it's a very competitive real estate market and we need to be able to have market rate developers include affordable units in their developments. And so we need a Palmer fix. We'd like to come back uh, with that bill again this next year. We had a unanimous uh, ruling by the California Supreme Court affirming the ability of the police to have a local jurisdiction if they so choose to adopt inclusionary. Now we need to be able to do that on the rental side and to address um, the, the Palmer case as it were. And just to clarify that it's, it, there, it's, there's no conflict between inclusionary and our rent control uh, laws in the state of California. So we want to come back and hold the governor to his work and, and put that bill back on his desk. And we also had, had co-sponsored uh, uh, AB 35, which is a tax credit bill. We think that's the appropriate um, mechanism. You know, a speaker Atkins again is part of her housing package. We really think it needs to be negotiated in the context of the budget next year. And we're going to ask our, our legislators here from the Bay Area to make the case in there. And even Los Angeles now, it's really becoming top of mind for those legislators as well. And so we think we can build up a real, a real uh, push here in the caucus to make sure that when they get in, in, in negotiations with the government in terms of the budget, that we're able to include affordable housing uh, as a top priority. Just as an aside, I would tell you that between Proposition C in San Francisco in 2012 and now Proposition A, which was just passed, San Francisco is now funding affordable housing to a greater extent than the entire state of California. Just to put it in context for you, it's like 0 .001 of our general fund we spend. That's currently just basically to retire uh, debt for previous housing bonds that have already been expended. Uh, and so we're at a crisis. And so I think my message tonight is that we need to take control of our own destiny. And we've got great local officials who are stepping up to the plate, both staff and, and elected, and, and doing things like Lou Rent Fund, which the city of Oakland has done. Alameda County, those are the former tax increment kind of property tax dollars that are coming back to the jurisdiction and setting those aside for affordable housing. We need to look at the potential of doing a housing bond here in Alameda County uh, to put that on the ballot and, and make the case as we have said to invest in affordable housing for our own people. We need to look at link, the commercial linkage fees so that when we do do commercial office development, we're making sure that those impacts are being addressed and we're actually providing funding for housing for, for lower wage workers. Uh, who are providing goods and services to these companies who are moving in. Uh, so in, in general, we need land, funding, and political will as a three-legged stool to get affordable housing built. And so I think public land is another key that's been talked about. We need BART to actually adopt a policy and have a good practice, but we need to codify that uh, as, as a policy of BART. They also have jurisdictions to look for all their properties and do that inventory because land is so critical and such an important resource to set that aside. And finally, we need as a community to support the entitlement and the approval of affordable housing at the higher densities along the transportation corridors in the downtowns. 
and make sure that we rally around and say we're all in this together and we're going to support the approval of these housing developments for our people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, as we speak, uh, there are cards being handed out if you want to write down a question that you want to ask. It's also a short survey being handed out that's going to give you an opportunity to talk about the things that you're about to hear right now. Everyone who's on the panel has been invited to speak on um, basically potential funding streams. And some are going to like, some you may not like. You know, Mr. Williams talked about can we tax ourselves? Some you're going to like that idea, some you're not. But we want to hear your feedback. We want you to first hear what the panelists have to say about them and then give us your reaction and your suggestions as it relates. I'm just going to call them out, and if a panelist wants to speak on it, you know, we'll do that. Uh, I'm going to go right down the list. Uh, so, because we think from the state level, you know, we know all of our cities are talking about how to impact uh, increased developer fees. We want to, at the state level, do what we can do to give the cities the most flexibility they can to increase the developer fee. We would like to hear from the panelists uh, if they see an opportunity there for the state or if there's anything else about the developer fees. Any panelists interested? Mr. Lane? Yeah, I'm sure I can take that. And we've actually got a uh, pretty good law in this area in terms of doing a nexus study that will demonstrate the impacts. Those haven't been challenged yet legally. I'm really interested though, as I said, the Palmer case on the inclusionary housing piece, where you can provide the units on site and or paying a move fee to be able to develop housing and leverage that with other dollars or land dedication. That can also be a piece of it to put together a deal where you have more activity units, but then you also have some land. Can you slow down a little bit? Slow housing. down a little bit, please. Yeah. Oh, will you all there to hear something? Could you get a little closer to the microphone, please? No, it's slowing down. Slow okay. down. They let me get to say so much, they just want you to take okay. a little time. I was trying to, to get as much in as I could before they came to my So, we, we actually can do the impact fees, the commercial linkage and housing impact fees, and do a nexus study to defend that. It hasn't been challenged yet. Uh, but we also we do need to be able to, to have local jurisdiction at least have the authority to adopt. Uh, inclusionary zoning ordinances if they so choose. And, and the bill was AB 1229 that some member Atkins had carried. And it would just clarify that for the purposes uh, of adopting these ordinances, there's no conflict with the Cost of Pocket Rental Housing Act. Uh, and that was clear in the legislative record, by the way, the legislature adopted. They didn't think that they were wiping out all of the existing inclusionary ordinances uh, that were already on the books. Uh, and, and so that, that's really, I think, where the state could step in and help us to move that bill. We were able to get it to the governor's desk. It was tough. Actually, Senator Leno, in, in a previous legislative session, had tried to move the bill and quickly to get it off uh, the Senate floor. So I think it's really an indication of the crisis that we were able to get. Now, we didn't have a vote to spare. A lot of mod dams docked and they didn't vote for the bill. But that was fine. Leadership made sure they had sufficient votes. And so that's, I think, going to be a top priority for the next legislative session in 2016. Now, I don't know if the California Building Industry Association at some point will also challenge uh, the impact fees in that whole regime, but I think we're pretty safe in terms of, of Nolan and Dolan and the idea that we're showing what, that there is a nexus and you actually have a, a feasibility analysis that comes with that in terms of what you're adopting and addressing impacts. And the courts typically are fairly deferential to local jurisdictions being able to, 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 um, to charge for impacts that they've demonstrated and that there's a compelling public interest in providing affordable housing. There are fair housing laws, for example. And just in, just in general, in terms of the police power of local jurisdiction to be able to adopt these types of ordinances. Thank you, uh, Ms. Williams. No, uh, it's not a legislative fix, but we've been involved um, in two major community benefits campaigns where we didn't have legislation, but we leveraged um, the entitlement process that a developer has to go through to get the uh, approvals for major developments and through some coalition building with base building groups uh, for the Brooklyn Basin uh, project that's under construction now at the waterfront of the 3,100 uh, units that the developer will build. We have an agreement uh, with the, the city and the developer that 465 of those units will be affordable uh, down to 30% of AMI. We also worked with uh, base building groups in San Francisco on the Candlestick Park uh, development where uh, negotiations with the developer and the city uh, led to a fund of $32 million that the developer will put into a housing fund, which is significant because they're not federal dollars. So some of the restrictions that normally apply 
to public dollars don't apply to that so the community can use those funds creatively to try to address the, the housing uh, issues as it perceives those. Those funds are controlled by uh, a community uh, group uh, elected by representatives of various community entities. So it's an alternative. Legislation would be great, but there are some other ways in which people have been able to organize themselves and make sure that some of the developments that are, occur uh, have uh, some level of affordable housing within them. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Just very quickly, uh, what I'll add is that uh, Richmond is, is in the process of finalizing the linkage fee, the nexus study that, that uh, Mr. Lane was talking about. And, and I think the, uh, you know, I think in the past there was the, the notion that, that high income housing subsidizes low income housing. And, and I think that there's going, going to be a sort of a growing market in terms of this commercial linkage where you, you do have uh, commercial development. There's, I mean, there's awareness that job producing also needs, uh, produces housing demand. And, um, and that I think again is a growing awareness. And, and if, I think if you do your homework and, and we'll see how it rolls out. I mean, it could be something where the, the state needs to just kind of watch out for it and make sure that the locals are protected when they do, when they implement those types of policies. Thank you, Ms. Glenn. Yeah, the, the one thing I would caution about, I, I'm all for the state uh, enabling localities to do inclusionary, I think it's really important. Uh, it's been a really important tool in high growth areas. Uh, but if we don't tackle the certainty of uh, development, uh, that developers who are building the market rate housing are actually gonna get through an approvals process uh, in some kind of uh, timely uh, way, but one, we're not gonna get the, the housing built. So I go back to, uh, you know, having some teeth in, in housing element law, number one. No, number two, on the impact fees, I also think we need to, there's, there's a nexus and there's a feasibility study, right? And so the feasibility study is really important as you look at the cost of building the market rate uh, housing. Uh, there are many communities uh, that are not San Francisco, but the costs are equal to the cost of building in San Francisco, but the rents or the home prices that the developers are gonna get are not equal to what they're getting in San Francisco. And therefore, in those communities, if you cannot charge these big impact fees, uh, that will actually kill the development from happening. So you're, you kind of kill the goose that lays the golden egg, and you'll get maybe a trickle of, um, uh, of impact fees that and, and instead of actually uh, getting housing built. So I, I, I'd be cautious about um, how one uses impact fees. And I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that's why it's one part of the solution, but that's why things like the boomerang funds that the, the city of Oakland has adopted are very important. And other sources that aren't dependent upon the underlying development, because you do only, when you have when development's going going strong, that's great, you're, you have revenues coming in. Or when, when projects are canceled, but when they don't, then you're actually not receiving revenue. So that's why to the extent that you can have other sources that are not dependent upon development, like a bond or other, other funding sources, have to be part of that mix as well. So you're not asking the private development to bear the entire burden, but just some of the burden in their appropriate fair share. And, and before we move on, just I, I really should have added to um, Bill's point about commercial linkage fees. I mean, you go back to the, the Bay Area has generated something like 500,000 jobs since the end of the recession, and I can't remember the number of uh, housing units, something like you know 55,000. So it, it is the, the job generation that we all you know like in terms of getting lower employment rate, unemployment rates, I and mean, it's a good thing that the Bay Area economy is doing well, but it has a consequence on the, on the housing market and that is you know, maybe a more appropriate place to be sure that we're, we're getting funding from. Thank you, we've got both sides of the conversation of uh, the impact of using developer impact fees. You know, I wanna just point out one thing about the survey, you know, and I know that you all are such good students, I can tell already that you all have already filled all of it out already, right? But I did wanna point out that if you, as you hear these ideas, if you really like something, it gets a five if that's your strongest like. If you really dislike it, it gets a one. That's the strongest dislike. And if you're somewhere in the middle, then it's somewhere in the middle. Just in case the grid was not clear, if you strongly oppose it, it's a one. If you strongly support it, it's a five. And so 
I also want to acknowledge a couple of people who walked in, a champion and um, all. Strongly opposed is a one. It's, a, it's an error on the form, and I was trying to politely clarify. Uh, thank you for busting me out. I should have just said that I made an error. We made an error. So five, five means you strongly support it. Correct. If, it's, if you love it, you put your hand up, all five, right? You got a five. If, it's a, if you oppose it strongly, it's a one. And then there's a range, and you can put it in between. A four would mean that you, I'm sorry, a two also is opposition, but not as, as, as strongly opposed. So it should read one strongly opposed, two opposed, three if you're neutral, four if you support, five if you strongly support. Sorry for the confusion. You good? If you, hey. I really we're sorry about that. This stuff is complex, but we're going to figure it out together like a family does, so let's do that. Someone who just came in, he's an elected, he's been a great leader on quality of life issues. He's been a friend and mentor to me and to many, and that's our own supervisor, Keith Carson, who's here tonight. Thank you. And another champion on issues of housing from the Berkeley Rent Board, Mr. Asa Dosworth is here. Asa, thank you. We have a form for the Berkeley Rent Board. <laughs> uh, the next item we want to hear from, if any panelists wish to share their thoughts, the notion in San Francisco um, there has been uh, money spent to help the school district sell parcels that can be used um, specifically to build housing for teachers, for um, their clerical staff, for people who work for the district who don't earn enough to, uh, to purchase in San Francisco or live in San Francisco, we'd like to hear from the panelists if there are things that you think the state can do to support school districts to be able to provide workforce housing, affordable housing, uh, by selling vacant parcels um, to do so. Yeah, that, that's really important. We actually sponsored legislation with some of our folks a couple years ago to just strengthen and clarify the surplus land statute, and we really think it's important for advocates to use that as a tool. I know they use that for the city of Oakland effectively as well. Uh, but the idea is, you know, the market's able to produce you know, luxury apartments and condominiums. So that, that vital resource of public land that we have, whether it's school districts, special districts, transportation, cities, and county, let's dedicate that for affordable housing to the possible. And we actually have opportunities for school districts who are not in the housing business, but they may have land to actually partner with our nonprofit affordable housing developers to get the, the housing built. And, and, and re even help with finance in some cases. We also have some great examples uh, from, the, from the San Mateo County Commun uh, Community College District, who's actually providing workforce housing on one site on, the, on that valuable resource of land. And then it goes back, I think, a best practice instead of selling the land to is to, to use a, a long-term ground lease to maintain affordability over time. Uh, it could be 99 years, for example, or, or a short period. Uh, but, but that's an important tool, and I think more of those conversations are taking place and we're seeing opportunities, and even uh, s school districts, K-12 districts are really looking at this as, as an opportunity uh, for their own workforce. Thank you. I think one of the things that we're looking at in the city of Oakland, we're, we're trying to come up with a public lands policy, and it would be great to have the opportunity to include a lot of the, the school district's property in that discussion, because as we've done some mapping, a lot of the, the vacant lots and the vacant buildings are school property, and it would be great to come up with a universal policy that we could use to, to facilitate that dialogue between the city and the school district. So I think it would be um, incredible if we could come up with something that would be um, be used across the board on all of the Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on, we'd like to ask uh, the panelists and our audience uh, your ideas about creating a state housing bond. And some years ago, uh, you all, we all passed a state housing bond, and that that money was supportive of a lot of things like first-time home buyer programs and neighborhood counseling programs and other support. But those dollars have been used up, and so we're asking the panelists your thoughts on us creating a state housing bond. So, as someone who spent a lot of her life getting that last uh, Prop One C housing bond passed. Uh, I think it was 
uh, incredibly successful. Uh, it was uh, very hard to get a global uh, consensus to do it. And I, I would just say one of the things that really helped is that it was uh, you know, Prop 1C, Prop 1, I can't remember all the, you know, different uh, uses, but uh, it was combined with other infrastructure needs of the state. And I think uh, thinking about it in that context, again, uh, would be uh, probably beneficial in terms of uh, looking at getting it passed. The big, you know, the big problem is it takes a two-thirds vote uh, to, to make it happen. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think the uh, Atkins bill, which was looking at, uh, you know, not a bond, but a different uh, way of making it uh, a, a, a trust fund happen at the state level, uh, is also a good idea. But a, a bond uh, is a is an alternative. Thank you. And I agree. And just to, to note that Kragunov, it really was the, the force behind getting Proposition One C on the ballot. Uh, it was the largest affordable housing bond in, in the history of the world, I think. <laughs> and, and so the idea, though, I think to, to connect ourselves with transportation is really critical. Transportation is a similar issue right now, looking for additional funding and stuck in the legislature looking for two Republican votes in each house. Uh, and to the extent that we could just say, well, we're not asking the legislature, just put it on the ballot let the voters decide where it's just a 50% threshold. Don't hold back all of our infrastructure investments in affordable housing. It won't be held against you. Just let, let the voters decide and get, try to get that out there. Or, Maybe we need to go out and collect signatures. As you know, there's a pretty low voter, a low, low threshold right now to collect signatures for 2016. And yes, it's going to be a busy ballot, but to the extent I think that we can work with transportation, as we did with the cap and trade funding, the affordable housing and sustainable communities program now, uh, at the Strategic Growth Council at the state level, that's a kind of model, I think, uh, that, that we can build upon. We also, for example, have a total fund here that the Metropolitan Transportation Commission uh, Overseas and, and really has committed to, and that's just to really make that connection be, between transport and affordable housing and our entire, entire network and transportation system. And I think the message to the voters is look, we want to help you with your commute times, this incredible traffic congestion, uh, kind of the terminal gridlock that we're all facing. And if we're going to go ahead and continue to permit new commercial and office uses, you're going to put more, more cars on, on the street unless we're able to both identify funding for transportation improvements, public transit. And, and affordable homes for that workforce. Thank you. The, the next uh, funding stream possibility we'd like our panelists to speak to is funding for our workforce housing tax credit. Mr. Lane. Yeah, so the, the tax credit issue is, is going to come back, as we have said, and there, there are, um, there's interest in the legislature, I think, for a series of tax credits. It's going to really require a negotiation with the governor who doesn't particularly like tax credits or you know, spending through the, 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 through the tax code, as it were. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's a majority vote, and I think we, we made some concessions in our bill of you know, five-year sunset, for example, so that it would, you know, would have to be renewed. It wasn't just permanent. Because the other thing is it, it, uh, if you adopt a tax credit, it takes a two-thirds vote to repeal it, which is the other thing because that's considered a tax increase at that point. So majority vote to adopt and two-thirds to repeal. That's why the governor probably would want to see a, a sunset, whatever we do. But there's also interest in, in farm worker housing, I know, in, in the Democratic caucus, the Latino caucus looking at, and perhaps a tax credit. And then in terms of workforce housing, that would have to be a, a state tax credit because the Internal Revenue Code, really section 42, that really that determines how we have to operate our, our low-income housing tax credit at the federal level, where really it requires that housing to be at 60% of AMI and below. And so there is kind of a gap there between 60 and, and maybe 100 that we're kind of missing. And that's, for example, why uh, Proposition A, which was just passed in San Francisco, also has significant portion funding, uh, local funding for that workforce housing. It may be in a place where you can't qualify for a tax credit, you know, but there may be opportunities to develop something that's in sort of higher income, but certainly that aren't wealthy and are still struggling uh, to pay three or $4,000 a month for rent. Thank you. The next funding issue is incentivizing cities to allocate a percentage of their redevelopment property tax trust funds or boomerang funds. So if you want to speak to how the state can incentivize cities to use the boomerang funds or speak to boomerang funds in general. Mr. Lindsay? Well, just very quickly, as I mentioned before, I, I kind of like to incentivize the state to um, really break the log jam in terms of getting properties back in the hands of the cities. Um, 
and uh, especially, or maybe maybe even exclusively looking at incentivizing um, getting properties back into the local hands for uh, when it's going to be used for a housing. And that's uh, that's been a terrible logjam for us in terms of the process of, of getting the, the uh, property back. Um, I can tell you that that from my perspective, anything that comes back in terms of revenue, the the, uh, you know, the so-called boomerang funds, um, I, I consider that to be found money of sorts. And so for me to to reinvest it or invest it in housing, um, I would have no problem doing that, and I don't think that our city council would either. And so one of the things I'd like to see to incentivize those jurisdictions, you know, some jurisdictions don't have a lot of those funds coming back. They still have enforceable obligations, et cetera. But for those who do and are willing to commit it to affordable housing and say at the 25% level, I think they should be allowed to bond against that. It's no new taxes, but if it's a significant strain, then we should give jurisdictions the tools to be able to go out and, and, and issue debt and to be able to front load their projects and move against that, that revenue stream. So that, that's something I'm interested in and looking at. I will the legislature for Thank you. Uh, we'd like to know your opinion and would you pay a dollar um, on your cable subscription to help in part fund workforce housing or affordable housing? No. 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 Yes. 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 So we heard a few amens, we heard a few no's. Panel was saying they don't want to speak to it, but we would ask you <laughs> on your survey to speak to it as a strong yes or no or neutral and why. It'd be a one-time, good question, it would be a one-time, imagine it as a one-time dollar transaction on cable, like once a year. Someone asked would it be once per month, be once per year. One dollar, go on your cable bill, you pay a dollar, and would you want that to happen and then have that money go to a pot of money to pay for affordable housing? So please mark it on the survey. We hear you loud and clear. Uh, next one, moving on, similar to that, would you, if panels care to speak to it, how would you feel about paying $1 on a DMV transaction once a year, $1 a time a year, that same thing, that money would go into a pot of money to provide affordable housing? Yes. Got it, if you would. Panels, we're going to move on to the next one, but if you would, mark your survey. Whether you like it, you dislike it, you're neutral, and why. Uh, the next one is that, and we're not picking on anybody, but we just want to put it out there in the conversation. To the panels, if you care to address it, that there would be large, that large corporations would be asked to pay a fee, and that fee would essentially create a pot of money for workforce housing or anti-displacement. We're not picking on anybody, but you could say that it could be Uber, or Airbnb or Google. This would be could the state help cities could the state help cities assess such a fee uh, for large corporations to provide money for workforce housing and anti displacement? Yeah. I'm going to ask her. I don't know um, initially about fee, but I think that um, when we look at these larger corporations that come in, that they should be at least at the table having the conversation right. because their businesses have an impact, and so they are having an impact on the housing needs, so they should at least be at the table having conversations with the jurisdictions in which they're going to implode, so that they can at least say, okay, we, we recognize that we're opening up this campus and we're bringing our business to your jurisdiction. Let's sit down and have a conversation how our workforce is going to have an impact on your jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to observe that I think business needs to share more responsibility, but I would go after Prop 13 and the mischief for the last yeah. years. And, and, and all of the corporate manipulation to avoid paying the transfer tax, that we've got billions and billions of dollars that they owe the rest of us, and it's worth the economy, and we're looking at something new, if we could just get them to play fair in terms of the intent of Prop 13, we might generate enough or, or more than all of these single things that we're, we're talking about and have enough capital to really attack the, the housing needs of, of the people of the state. So I know that's sacred territory, Prop 13, 
but it's also a, a great deal of, of mischief, if not criminality, on the part of the corporate community in avoiding paying, paying their fair share. I heard Ron Dellums once say that when somebody says something great, you just say, I want to associate myself with the remarks of my distinguished colleagues. So, what he said is true. I'm just going to say. Well, I, I agree that um, you know, commercial uses uh, need to pay a you know, fair share for the burdens that they're uh, putting on communities. And housing is like infrastructure, and it you know, needs to be accounted for, whether it's through commercial linkage fees and feed on corporations or you know, a change in, um, in the property. Thank you. Uh, so these are all of the, the fee and revenue strategies that um, we've heard through our stakeholder groups, through our listening tour, through the online surveys that we've received. If there's one that you love that you didn't hear tonight, we invite you to write that down on your survey form. What we want to do now is have the panelists address some of the questions uh, that you all have put forward. And uh, the first one would go to Ms. Galante. If you're willing to talk more, uh, thank you for bringing us Grim, um, and talk more about the building part of Grim. You know, when you say, how much building should take place and where should the, the money for the building come from? I think my point about uh, building was that we do have uh, land and underutilized properties uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, that, that can be used for uh, additional development. And unlocking those lands uh, and ensuring that communities have, are incentivized uh, to approve new development um, on those properties is, is really how it's going to happen. So this isn't, from, from my perspective, the building part of this isn't about the funding source, it's about getting more development to happen. Yes, we need funding sources to make some of that housing more affordable to more people. Uh, and I wouldn't uh, say that you, know, you could just build uh, market rate housing and not have some additional money to um, put towards the affordable housing piece, but we've got to have a better uh, way of getting housing approved in, in California uh, or you know, we're going to continue to be in this uh, situation. Thank you. Um, one of the questions from our audience uh, to our panel, what is the role that Costa Hawkins and the Ellis Act play in the housing crisis? Well, I think particularly in, in Oakland, any, any unit within that was built after 1983 is not covered under our rent ordinance. So you have projects that are um, over 25 years old who they're not impacted by having any, any limitation on how much their rent can be increased. So those units that are not covered by Costa Hawkins can have a 100% rent increase. Um, we last year passed a, in our rent ordinance that within one year the increase can be no, no more than 10% and no more than 30% over a five year period. So if, it is, if it's not in the rent ordinance, no, there is no limitation as to how much the rent can be increased. So you could have a 100% rent increase, you could have a 200% rent increase, and um, we have no jurisdiction over that. Mr. Lane, thank you. It's, it's, just been, it's been interesting uh, to watch this around, around the area. Even communities that would never have even uttered the words rent control or rent stabilization. It's really on the agenda, and it, it's a tough vote for local electives, but they're taking a hard look at it. Some of the limitations that the cost of Hawkins imposes are, of course, vacancy fee control. So if someone, as soon as someone moves out, the, the rents can go back up to whatever the market is. So that's a challenge. And of course, it's not means tested, and so you, you can have people with various incomes you know, benefiting from a, a rent control plan. It's kind of one of the downsides. Uh, but, but a lot of jurisdictions are taking a look at this, particularly because we've seen some of the gouging and some of the outrageous increases in private sector sometimes when it gets out of control then calls for government intervention happen and I think we're starting to see some of that happen uh, in places all over there that were you know, relatively um, more more moderate or even conservative communities where, where that discussion is taking place because the economic displacements uh, are happening every week and, and our local electors are wrestling with this issue 
Uh, and I know that it takes time to build additional supply, and we have, we're short of funds, and so what do you do in the meantime when you're losing some of the key members of your community? Uh, school districts are suffering in terms of, of enrollment and, and lower wage workers having to travel. And a lot of times, for example, on the peninsula when we walk around the downtowns, the help one signs for lower wage workers and the windows of, of, of the of the shopkeepers that they can't find the lower wage workers because they would have to commute from so far uh, to be able to work. And so I think the business community is really starting to feel this, and that's one of the reasons I think they're stepping up and trying to work with us uh, on, on potential housing solutions. Again, I want to ask you all to continue the rent, uh, renter uh, conversation, um, whether or not you could see a strategy uh, for a voucher that mirrors Section 8 voucher. And if you think about that in terms of workforce housing, and I'm, I'm looking at some notes that talk about what the area median income is in Contra Costa and Alameda County. Someone who's at 40% of area median income is earning $26,000 a year. Someone who's at 100% of AMI earns $65,000 a year. With that as a context, that, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about working people. Um, could you envision a voucher program similar to the Section 8 voucher program for renters who are between 40 and 100 percent of AMI? Could you envision one? What would it look like? I think we can. I mean, we've got, we've got to fix the, the current Section 8 program that we've got. We actually have utilization rates that are dropping off the cliff for the, for the reasons that we heard. I think project-based Section 8 is important, but you know, moving to work housing authorities can, can do project-based and project-based up to 30% of the other vouchers. And more are having to do that because families after 90 or 120 days are having to turn back their vouchers because they can't buy units. In California, we don't have a source of income discrimination protection. Now, the state of Oregon actually a couple of years ago passed a law. So, so landlords can still say Section 8 need not apply, we don't have to take it. And I think housing authorities are trying to do their part on their end to actually work with landlords so that this will take months to get a unit inspected and they can turn around quickly so it's not a loss for a landlord. But you know, the payment standard of HUD is, you know, the 40 percentile is never gonna be able to really you know, keep up with where the market is. And then of course, uh, we have this anomaly where based on HUD's methodology, they're actually saying fair market rents are declining in, in contra costs in Alameda counties, which of course is outrageous, and yes. You know, you can, can challenge that and do your own, you know, market study, but you shouldn't have to do that, you know, so we need to really fix that, that methodology too. And if we're going to say that vouchers are part of the solution, we really need to get landlords to work with, with tenants, and maybe there need, we need to provide some incentives for, for landlords to be able to do that too. And if you say maybe that's another tax credit idea, I don't know, or, or some kind of rebate on your property tax to be able to, to set aside some units for Section 8 voucher, which kind of like an inclusionary component, but provide, provide a care as, as well for, for landlords. Thank you, Ms. Colante, and then Mr. Lindsay. So, so two things. Um, I, I'm not sure whether the question was whether we should be looking to the federal government to uh, increase the voucher program or go up the income spectrum um, on the voucher program. I can just say as someone who spent a lot of time there dealing with the HUD budget, the, the voucher program, uh, it, you know, it's very expensive and the federal government is not gonna come and save us and say, uh, because your rents are high in the San Francisco Bay Area, I don't think you know the uh, Congress people from Texas really care enough to uh, help us go up the income spectrum uh, in in the Bay Area. So I don't think the federal government is going to increase the income levels to use uh, the federal voucher program. Having said that, and I'm going to go way out here uh, since my my colleague uh, to the to the, my right. Uh, touch the third rail, and, and I'll touch the third rail, which is, uh, you know, there's there's plenty of money in the state of California that's being diverted through the uh, homeowner's mortgage interest deduction. Yes. Uh, that goes to, you know, much uh, wealthier people who are, who are benefiting from, from the mortgage interest deduction, and you could shift some money from that type of program to a broader renter's uh, credit like a voucher, but I would suggest trying to do something that is um, a simplified version of the voucher program through through a, a, a broader renter's credit. Um, I don't think, I think that would be politically very difficult, so, but I'll put it out there. And I agree with that, and just one, I thought you might, might talk about a state type of a voucher program, because I agree with that, that's, that's, that's probably off the table. But but just as an idea about this mortgage interest deduction, just, just to, to clarify for folks, 
That's actually a $5 billion hit to the state's general fund. That's our largest housing program in the state. It actually subsidizes people with very large mortgages uh, in a million dollar homes, et cetera, who you know, benefit from that disproportionately. And so if we could take a portion of that and really direct it to the folks who need the help, I mean, there again, that is a very real, that's tough politics, but really in terms of good public policy, that's what we should be doing. We like the third rail idea, so we just, we just need some help with uh, some of our colleagues in the middle of the state to help them see that it's in their best interest too. But we keep the ideas coming, we think that they're great. Uh, we had a question uh, from several in the audience that has to do with increasing housing supply. Um, and the question is, what can we do to increase it from both for-profit and non-profit developers, and how do we encourage building and decrease the not-in-my-backyard phenomenon? Well, one of the things that we did in Oakland is we developed our specific plans, which basically got the, uh, the process of having to do a full um, scale CEQA and um, a EIR and things of that nature. And so it allows the, the developer to basically look at the specific plan and determine whether or not their project meets those specifications. And if they do, they just have a checklist that they can kind of move through the system, and so we're hoping that that will speed up the process of meeting projects through the system. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the questions, and you know, everybody keeps asking, why aren't there cranes moving? You know, you see all the cranes in San Francisco, why aren't there cranes in Oakland? And I sometimes ask myself that question, too, and still have not come up with the answer. So I, I think we are trying to do as much as possible to speed up the process. Um, they keep saying to, to me that right now projects don't pencil out in Oakland and, and that the rents aren't high enough and that, um, so I don't know how high the rents have to go before they will pencil out, but I think one of the things that it is that is happening is that um, the land values are so high, so um, the developers are purchasing land forecasted at a higher amount, and so when they get ready to do their performers and determine how much the rents are going to to come out because of the construction costs are high, they are still saying that they haven't penciled out. So I, I'm hoping that um, with the with the movement of our specific plans, um, that we'll see more development in the next couple of months. Thank you. Uh, the next question has to do with co-ops. And to the panelists, uh, what do you think about housing co-ops as a tool for affordable home ownership? So Lindsay. I uh, definitely think that they could play a role. I, I think that the um, we have uh, an example, a great example of a, of a, a co-op housing in, uh, in Richmond is Atchison Village, um, which was developed in the late 40s uh, as, a, as a housing co-op and it's managed to maintain throughout the years its affordability. I think that um, it can uh, some, uh, Operate similar, I think, to a community land trust in the, in the way it, it um, uh, deals with with uh, either higher higher purchase costs or rents, and uh, so I, I definitely think it's something to, to look into. Um, I think uh, examining all of the so-called shared equity models is really important because part of the discussion we're having is about how we continue to do the things we've always done uh, that haven't proven to be equitable. And I think as you look at land trust models, uh, cooperative ownership models, resident managed uh, cooperatives where there is not ownership on the part of the folks who inhabit the housing, but that they, uh, through uh, a nonprofit organization, manage uh, the facilities that they live in order to bring down the cost, that all of these sort of models, and I know the immediate criticism is that they're boutique, they're only boutique because they change around the power relationships around ownership. And it's not developers who own it, it's not housing authorities, it's people having a different relationship to ownership of, of the property uh, with um, uh, an explicit purpose of stewardship. Um, in our land trust in San Francisco's, in Sonoma's and all of the, the land trusts, we're committed to permanent affordability of whatever housing that we bring in and uh, into the land trust. And that's really important because 
when we did a piece of research for the city of Oakland for their housing equity uh, roadmap that uh, has been considered by city council and adopted as a policy platform, the most startling part of that research and data analysis that we did is the universality of the affordability crisis. We went by census tracts through the whole city and took what the median income was at median rental uh, and uh, purchase price. Nobody in Oakland in any neighborhood through that analysis could afford their neighborhood. Uh, and what that means is that uh, we're all, as we grow the downtown area, a block from here and all that nightlife, what people are saying is, yeah, I could afford it, but I'm not going to. I want some disposable income, so they're pushing down to the next rung of the housing market to keep that disposable income, to go to all those clubs and nice restaurants. <laughs> that pushing goes down every level. You know who gets pushed out? Black and brown people who stayed in this community when nobody wanted it, when there was a period of disinvestment, and now they're being pushed out of this community. Part of the biggest, for us, part of this housing crisis is the composition and nature of this community is changing in Oakland as a result of the housing crisis. And what drew a lot of us to this community, it's diversity, it's appreciation by everybody of the diversity, people getting along. That's being destroyed because big segments of the population are being forced out of here. Between 2000 and 2010, Oakland lost 25% of all its black population. Right? We are no longer a plurality or far from a majority. So for me, we, we need to look at some alternative ways of thinking about the housing. Yes, we need development. Yes, we need to build and, and up our production. We need financing schemes. But in the course of that, we need to think about what does the tenure of, of, of housing ownership look like? And are there some different models that will help to counteract some of the displacement and to make sure that we remain the sort of diverse community uh, that, as I said, attracted many of us to Oakland in the first place. And this is one of the question that many in the audience have asked, what can the state do to slow, to slow and reverse displacement? What activities should the state be pursuing to help our cities and communities slow and reverse displacement. So I, I'll so. say a couple things. One follows up um, on the comment about cooperative or alternative forms of uh, ownership. Uh, the you know the state has a housing finance agency, and you know it's very difficult to finance the kind of alternative product uh, that Mr. Williams is talking about. Whether that's uh, shared. Uh, equity uh, with restrictions uh, on our community land trusts, whether that's um, a variety of, of programs like that. And I think you could, you know, direct the Housing Finance Agency to pilot some financing products to help enable uh, this uh, type of housing uh, to, to happen. And I think they, they probably have the power to do that, but they might need a little bit of push from the uh, legislature and similarly on the displacement um, I think there are some uh, changes that have just been made to the new cap and trade funding uh, there were proposed changes anyway to the new cap and trade dollars for affordable housing and sustainable communities uh, that recognize that anti-displacement strategies are an important place for the state uh, to be putting uh, some of their money uh, when they when they're putting affordable housing, acquisition of existing uh, apartment complexes or, or single family homes for that matter by mission oriented nonprofit organizations that maybe aren't going to use a myriad of uh, sources of funding to reduce the rents, but they will you know, buy the properties and stabilize them uh, from, from increasing uh, rents is something that, again, use, use of these various funding sources that we've talked about um, could be used more aggressively in um, anti-displacement strategies. I just want to mention, we've been fascinated and have been kind of monitoring what's happening in Portland. Uh, Portland has adopted a policy 
uh, with respect to giving priority to people who were displaced from certain neighborhoods. The traditionally black neighborhood in Portland was North Portland and has been decimated uh, as a result of, of investments and displacements. And what the, the city has done is to adopt a policy that gives priority to people who were displaced from that neighborhood in city-funded housing uh, development so that they get an opportunity to come back. It's not preventive in the sense that it keeps, and I'm still searching all around, because I've not found many examples in all this displacement and gentrification discussion. I keep asking our staff and other people, do you know any place where they've been able to stop the gentrification and displacement or reverse it and mitigate it? And I don't, I, I don't have anything yet. But this is attractive, it's after the fact, but at least trying to get folks who got displaced to, uh, as a result of the development, an opportunity. It's being subject to, uh, obviously, legal analysis right now by the Portland City uh, Attorney to see if it'll pass fair housing law muster, but it's the sort of thing that might be attractive if we can do it in a way that, that, that comports with uh, fair housing law. Uh, thank you. We had a number of questions that deal with redevelopment, and so I'm going to combine some of the thoughts that came up in the questions and ask the panel your thoughts on this. And so clearly our cities are still reeling from the loss of redevelopment. There have been several bills that legislators have introduced, some have passed and been signed, that are, that top themselves as the successor to redevelopment, but yet cities are still looking for money. We've seen the the infrastructure financing districts that people are still trying to interpret what's their impact and relevancy for cities. We've heard um, some bills just this past session uh, that were passed that call themselves successful redevelopment, but yet cities still don't have the dollars that they need. And let's face it, that's how we got into this mess. To our panel, what do you see as the next step to promote the follow-up to the loss of redevelopment that will really give the tools to the cities that we're talking about to probably do that work. How do we close the gap between the bills that have been passed and what else needs to happen to really provide cities with the tools to do what redevelopment previously did? Ms. Berg. Well, I'm still searching for those bills to, that have passed and how they can have an impact because they haven't reached over them yet. <laughs> I think as Michael talked about the ability to be able to fall on um, our 25% boomerang funds and to potentially not have to go through a vote of approval so that we basically are using that source of, of funds that we have set aside. I, I think the other thing, and even though we, we, we also talk about a loss of redevelopment, I think we also need to talk about the loss of our federal funds at the same time. Um, at the same time when redevelopment was dissolved, HUD cut home funds by 45% and now they're considering to cut just completely decimated. So not only did we lose $27 million of redevelopment funds, we lost two and a half million dollars of federal home partnership funds. And that which left us with $2 million and now we're possibly going to, to lose that $2 million as well. So I, I think if there if there is really going to be any type of bills that are passed, it will be specifically setting aside funds for affordable housing. <coughs> Notes that there have been pieces and inklings, and you got to jump through this hoop to get it, or you got to go through this. But I think, unless there is something specifically set aside that is specifically for jurisdictions to use those funds for affordable housing, they will not be used directly for that issue. Thank you, Mr. Williams. So, a couple of things about that there have been a couple of bills, and they're somewhat political, I watch, but I would say in general, we're never going to get back to the full power. A redevelopment we had before because we'll never be allowed to tap into the school portion. I don't think we, we should. We understand that in terms of those property taxes that go to schools and the state had to, to then backfill. But on the other hand, to the extent that the cities and counties can work together on projects of mutual interest, that you can increase that tax increment. So you're going to have to have cooperation with other taxing entities to really to be able to really generate real real tax increment. Uh, and so I think that's important. Um, the enhanced infrastructure financing districts and then the Alejo bill, which was really targeted for disadvantaged communities, that's a start. Um, and it may, for example, for military-based reuse plans, where you don't have voters, you know, you could have property owners to put something together. 
That may be helpful. The problem is you're going to have to feed these at first because you're not going to be generating significant tax increment. If you're just sequestering the city's portion of tax funds, that's really not going to be able to, to allow you to do much. So it could be a part of a solution, but I think you're going to have to include boom rain and other sources to really get back to even half of what we had under redevelopment. Now, the good things I think about the Alejo bill that the governor did sign is it doesn't require voter approval to issue debt or to set up one of these, these authorities and, and that. So that's a start, maybe we can build on that and broaden it, but now you have to be in a census tract that's, you know, high poverty, unemployment, and crime, so it's really almost kind of like kind of finding the definition that we had under redevelopment, so we probably need a little broader tool. And then what we'd like to see uh, in terms of the enhanced infrastructure financing district is that voter approval requirement completely removed. Now we may need the governor to get that done, I'm not sure, but maybe we can keep moving and use that Alejo bill as a breakthrough to kind of begin to expand and give local jurisdictions the tools and the opportunity if they want to invest in their own communities to be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, you know, we've had the benefit of having deep expertise and experience from a great panel and they've shared generously. Let's give them a round of applause. We want you to have an opportunity to have a word with them uh, before we leave this chamber. We want to also make sure that we get a chance to collect your survey so that we can begin to synthesize many of the ideas that you've shared, your reactions, your preferences. Um, I want to thank the staff of uh, 15th Assembly District. My staff, they're here. They're standing in the wings. Thank you to our staff from the 15th Assembly District. So where we go from here is we begin the work of synthesizing some of the ideas that were discussed by our panel, from the feedback that you've given us from your reaction to some of the financing mechanisms that you've had. We go from there to having conversations with Democratic Assembly members in our caucus to talk about how to make this a priority throughout the state of California. That means that we'll be talking about the Bay Area, we'll be talking about LA, we'll be talking about inland areas in ways that we figure out how a bill can move forward or a package of bills that speaks to the entire need of our caucus. The only way that we'll get money for a low-income housing tax credit and a workforce housing tax credit is if when the speaker and the pro tem and the governor get into a room they know that they're speaking about a bill that was a priority to our caucus. And so this is where you come in. We're gonna need your help to take the energy from our meeting tonight to the members throughout this area and throughout the state to help them hear you say that this is a priority, that we will be moving forward a bill that looks at workforce housing tax credits, low-income housing tax credits, the boomerang funds, and some of the ideas that we heard here tonight and many of the innovative proposals to help move this forward. Can we help, can we count on you to help us move this forward with the legislators? Let me hear you say yeah. yeah. Are you ready to fight with us for affordable housing for the people of California? Let me hear you say oh yeah. Oh yeah. You've been a great audience. We thank you and look forward to the work and the conversation. Thank you.